welcome to Adama's first clinic. Um, this, is, uh, this is a bit of an experiment. We've never done this before. Today's subject area is uh, the control of septoria, particularly pertinent right now um, as the season is uh, snapping around our heels. Um, the objective of this session is um, really to use Andy Bailey, our septoria expert, um, as a vehicle to really get um, to a really hearty discussion around septoria um, and for people to go away from this session feeling that they've really understood the disease and aired any questions that they have um, to, to somebody that knows what they're talking about. Um, so the rules of engagement of this session, you're, you are all muted. Um, questions have been submitted over the last uh, couple of weeks and they've been entered into the presentation so Andy can address them as he goes through but please don't let this um, con constrain you in your questioning. Um, please use at the bottom of the screen you'll see a Q&A button. Um, please do add to that as you go if anything pops up that you would like Andy to, um, to answer for you. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll look over those Q and A's and address them at the end. Um, uh, if you if you do have any questions, please try not to use the hand up because it then um, it becomes quite complicated um, to ensure that we um, don't have too many people speaking over. So use the Q and A button if you if you've got to say something. There is a basis point. Um, uh, um, joined to this presentation. Hopefully you will have uh, provided Abby your basis number and that will be submitted um, and will be added to your points. Abby is recording this session as we go so at the end it will be emailed around to you so those that haven't been able to join us today um, can then um, listen to the, the presentation at a later date. So um, without further ado let's get into it. Um, so as I say, questions have been coming in um, over the last couple of weeks. We've got five different section areas that we'll, uh, we'll address as we go. But as I say, if anything crops up, please just use that Q&A button at the bottom. So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, we'll go one at a time um, in the, uh, the section of understanding septoria, and then Andy will address each one um, and then uh, summarise at the end of this section. So Andy, question number one comes in from Seamus in Hampshire. Where does the initial infection come from um, to a crop sown in the autumn and can the infection be delayed? Okay, <clears throat> so uh, hopefully everybody can hear me loud and clear here. Um, initial infection uh, arises from um, from from basically from from ascospores which uh, which are on on green bridge plants um uh, or, or sort of uh, seated in stubbles etc so the, there's plenty of septoria infection around because because we're growing we're growing wheat in in rotations there's a lot of wheat about and therefore septoria um is is surviving uh, from crop to crop so there's no real problem with it jumping from crop debris from previous crops etc or coming in um, as airborne ascospores uh, which actually land on the emerging crop and therefore infect it um, the question of uh, can infection be delayed um, i think i think that's that's may be quite poignant at the moment because it's it's very interesting linked to linked to the control of black grass we're seeing a lot more wheat crops now um particularly in the south and east of of the country being delayed uh in terms of drilling into uh, in into mid and late october um this delaying drilling um gives the um the, the infection and build up it can actually reduce it so so because because there's more time between when the plants emerge etc and then there's less time in favorable conditions for the uh, infections to become established so delayed drilling can have uh, quite an impact actually on septoria infections in the autumn um, you've only got to roll it back 
few years when we were drilling winter wheat uh, in August. Um, and, you know, the infections that we had by, by the middle of the autumn uh, were very well established because septoria just had some ideal conditions to, to proliferate in the autumn. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, question number two from Will in Gloucestershire. Can septoria spores from cereals transmit to any vegetable crops? This is an interesting one. I would, um, I, I have to admit, I don't, I don't know the true answer to this. Um, obviously, septoria is an issue in, 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 in crops such as celery. Um, it's also, it also infects um, other arable crops such as linseed, etc. But, but, but these are, these are usually um, different different sort of species um so i'm not sure whether it transmits across my gut feeling is no um but again we could check that out um and i think there's going to be a way of, uh, of responding to some of these questions that aren't answered now yeah that'll get included on the uh, mail around okay question number three is it ever worthwhile slowing septoria down in the late autumn and that's from chris in cambridgeshire Yeah, this is this is an interesting one, and I think I think just what I was saying a little earlier about um, when when we used to well when you drill when you early drill winter wheat, um, you know the older practices of, of drilling it at low seed rates in August, but uh, but now of course also the the earlier drilling um, in September then you can end up with with quite well established infections again in favorable conditions in the autumn um, and it's a fair question i would say uh, that that some of the work that has been done hasn't actually shown a benefit really um, to slowing it down much in the autumn in terms of a benefit um, that's realized at the end of the day um, in, in a yield benefit, not to my knowledge. Um, going back again to some of that really early drilled stuff when there used to be a lot of septoria in it um, in October, you used to be thinking, wow, we should be spraying this. But um, I've not seen a lot of compelling work that shows a financial return on that. Okay, thank you. Um, then from Wendy in Humberside, does yellow rust infection outcompete septoria? I would say from from my um, from my many years of uh, of conducting fungicide field trials in in the earlier part of my career, it certainly does out out compete septoria. Um, you know, the rust rust has a shorter life cycle um, than, than than septoria. It rapidly cycles, uh, and in warmer temperatures, it, it, it well yellow rust can go in 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 reasonably cooler temperatures actually providing it's got the moisture um, but it, it, it will it will cycle very quickly and there's competition for green leaf area on a leaf and the rust's ability uh, can be really overwhelming um, and it's also the rust the rust is is biotrophic so it, it, it needs um, living leaves to infect and, and proliferate um, you know the septoria can 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 act a bit more saprophytically in some respects. So, uh, but certainly rust, certainly rust, I think can outcompete septoria, but never be lulled into a situation where you think the septoria the septoria has gone away because it will still be there. It'll still be going through its life cycle, and it'll still be producing pycnidia and spores. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. And then from Joe in Berkshire. Is the severity of the disease affected by warmer, wet and latent conditions? Um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, typically, typically a latent period for septoria is somewhere between two and four weeks. But this is this is very dependent on temperatures, for example, if, if we're if we're in a warm, wet May, uh, latent periods come right down. Um, we get faster cycling disease and we just get we just get more and more disease rapidly occurring so uh, warmer wetter conditions yeah are uh, 
are going to present a big challenge in terms of septoria development. Excellent. And then the final question in this section is from Pip in Suffolk. How do you suggest managing the risk of, se risk of septoria in winter wheat when it has a significant latent period where much of the damage has already been done to the leaf by the time the disease becomes visible? How long would you say the late, average latent period of septoria is? Yeah, I think this 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 is um, this this is a key point here from Pip, and I think um, the we we need th this is something that that also has is starting to change now because of the chemistry and the some of the erosion of some of the chemistry which we have to control. Um, so this this becomes more and more crucial. It's always it's always been crucial, but. Um, the latent period of infection is is the point from from which the the spores infect the leaf to when you can actually visibly see symptoms uh, in the leaves. But so to when they become apparent, and as we've said, that that time period changes depending on external conditions, temperatures, and moisture, etc. So so. Basically, um, the, there's the, the, there's a lot of thinking that will say that that with crop protection from well with fungicides working fully, then if you're trying to control septoria and you're be beyond halfway through its latent period, so this is when the actual mycelia, you know, the, the spores landed on the leaf. The germ tube has come out, it's, it's penetrated uh, the stomatus, it's gone inside the leaf and then the hyphae start to, uh, start, to, start to grow within the leaf. Now, if you're applying even a curative product and you go beyond half of that time, so if you're beyond 50% of that time, then you're really going to struggle to curatively eradicate that infection and stop. So, so clearly, clearly there's a period of time there that it is absolutely crucial. And what is even more crucial now is that we don't really have the full curative effect from the azoles that we used to have because that's been eroded through resistance. So it really is becoming more and more crucial that we start laying down protection even before we get into latent periods. It's, it, it's always been the best way to control diseases, but it's becoming even more and more important now that we should be preventatively controlling diseases and not leaving it too late because, you know, some of that toolbox has been eroded by uh, insensitivity from the pathogen. So, um, so yeah, a lot more. We'll probably go on a bit more to talk about... Um, preventatively coated leaf layers etc but uh, but the key really is to get protection out on the key leaves as they're emerging so that we don't get into latent periods of infection okay, okay. thanks andy Do you want to go on to the next slide? Yeah, yeah. I was just this 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 is just a graphic of the life cycle here. And I think I think as you can see, uh, down at the bottom we've got we've got overwintering um mycelium, etc. on on debris. Um then on the autumn crops we've got we've got ascospore production. Then then within Within the actual, um, the initial infections are usually down to ascospores, but when you get into actually the uh, disease progressing up the plant from the early point in the spring to when it's actually climbing through the leaf layers, um, it's it's more from from these these small black fruiting bodies in the lesions releasing the little spores called pycnidia spores. Um, and they are actually transferred by rain splash 
uh, and also with with leaves, infected leaves rubbing on uh, on non-infected leaves uh, and spreading the infections around. So within the canopy, it provides an ideal environment if the conditions are conducive for this pathogen to start to move up and infect newly emerging leaves within within the crop. Um, so yeah, yeah. So they're 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 the most um, most important. Uh, the pycnidia spores are the most important way of, uh, of cycling the disease within the crop. When you get to the end of the season again, um, it's really about starting the whole process again, and then you get the asker spores starting the next development cycle into the next crop. Okay, section two is all about new chemistry. I'll take these... Um, these two questions from Stuart in North Yorkshire and Michael in Norfolk, both at the same time, because they're, they're about the same thing, really. So, so Stuart asked, is there any new chemistry like STHIs nearing production? And then Michael asked, asked I hear that new fungicides are coming soon. When will they be available, please? Yeah, OK, I've got a slide here that kind of, uh, kind of explains a little bit about, about new chemistry. Um, we, we, we're really looking forward to a new mode of action for septoria control and there is a product which I'm sure a lot of you will heard, have heard about called uh, Inatrec uh, from Dow and I think that is due to be available in the marketplace providing it goes through the regulatory process at the correct speed uh, in 2019. Um, there is also, uh, of course, a, a product from BSF called Revisol. Now, this this is a new triazo. So this is this is existing chemistry, um, but I understand this is a, a very effective uh, triazo, uh, and providing again that this goes through the registration process at the uh, at the expected pace, then it should be available around 19 or 20. Um, just just a word about this because this this is a triazole so whilst in a track is completely new mode of action so there shouldn't there shouldn't be any any cross resistance issues to any other chemistries currently available so we should have a fully sensitive population of septoria to that um revisol is a, is is a triazole so we'll have to see how that goes, really. I guess from from when the uh, from when it's actually brought um, into the marketplace. Of course, both of these uh, products will need resistance management, um, and I'm sure they will be uh, they will be stewarded um, appropriately. And we'll probably talk about some of that later. Um, applied with uh, together with other modes of action. Just to mention as well um, that, of course, you will know that there are two new SDHI products um, available this year. Um, you'll have heard a lot about the Salatinol SDHI from Syngenta. Um, that's a new SDHI molecule. Uh, and then also there's, uh, there's the Ascra product from Bayer. That's a mixture of Bixofen, which was in Aviator, um, and that is together with um, the newer SDHI, Fluopyram. So that, that's, um, that's the first time that two um, SDHIs have been placed in combination in a product. Um, and of course, these products. Well, in the um, in the co-formulated mixture of the Ascra, there uh, there's there's also an azole um, and also the uh, salatinol. It would, you know, it will always be um, be used in combination with uh, with another mode of action. Just a, just a note on further SDHI molecules. There will be. Um, future generation SDHI molecules coming, which are new. Uh, the SDHI mode of action, uh, it's an extremely diverse area of chemistry structurally, um, and many different uh, SDHI molecules, they, they differ because they have different spectrum of activity, um, and they also, uh, very similar to the triazoles, 
the newer ones or the third generation or will be in fourth generation, I guess soon, um, they're, they're, they're finding much more effective ones. But we need to be mindful that these are all specific um, modes of action. So you do get cross resistance with SDHI chemistry. It's not as clear as with other types of chemistry. So if you think strobal urines, when pathogens mutate to strobal urines, they often mutate to all the strobal urines, almost no difference whatsoever. With SDHI molecules, you can, it's not complete cross resistance per se, because there are some slight differences, um, but we need to be mindful that, that it is a specific mode of action and therefore um, these things are SDHI modes of action. Okay. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> okay, on to section three. This is all about resistance management. And the first area is very much in terms of SDHI resistance. So I'll go one at a time here. So Alistair B in Wiltshire, do you think resistance to SDHI chemistry will significantly present itself in the field this year in wheat and barley? And also, is it likely to drop drop off in a similar way to strobes? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. I wish I had the answer. Um, but 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 honestly, the in turn, I think we need to be careful about SDHI um, and 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 a lot of the stuff that's that that's been in the press over the last couple of years about it. Um, we are still in a situation where SDHI chemistry is working well in the field against septoria triticae. So, um, you know, they're performing well, but on a cautionary note, there have been strains isolated which are um, more insensitive um, so we, we do have these less sensitive strains in the population, some of which are extremely highly insensitive. And, and, and in testing, um, as in, in the Rothamsted work, the, the, these, these strains of uh, a mutation called 152, um, you can't control them with, 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 with full rates. So, so they are highly insensitive but we don't know about their fitness penalties. And when, when pathogens mutate, um, let's, be, let's be clear, these are dynamic biological systems. And as these polycyclic diseases, such as Septori, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're cycling all the time, um, and the mutations occur from season to season, um, and, and these are happening many, many, a lot of these mutations might be highly resistant to a chemical, but that mutation comes with it, a fitness penalty where they just can't survive in a natural population. So they just, they just, they just cease to exist straight away. So, so it's going to be really interesting to see how this 152 strain progresses and how it overwinters because that's the other thing is some of these strains that they can't overwinter you know they, they, there's a fitness penalty so so it's going to be interesting to see how that goes because if we start to see a build up in the population of that 152 then then that could pose us some some serious problems there are also a lot of SDHI strains which are much more moderate, and they're the ones that form more. Uh, I think I think uh, Chuggers in Ireland thinks that they're at about six percent of the population now. Um, these are moderate uh, insensitive strains, but they're still at a relatively low level within the population, and they're not affecting field performance. So. We don't have what I would call field resistance at the moment. And a lot of monitoring is going on in, in season. Um, and I think it's a key point to note that most of the 
instances where we're finding the most of these insensitive strains, particularly the highly insensitive ones, they're actually coming from trial sites where we are applying a lot of SDHI selection pressure. And when wider monitoring is done in commercial situations, we're just not seeing as many of these things. So it's just a, it's just to, to kind of balance this a little bit. Um, there are some, there are some people who believe we're, we're kind of on the edge of a precipice looking over it and it could all collapse <laughs> beneath us. But I think, I think we're probably in a situation where we need to continue to protect SDHI chemistry with azoles, with multi-sites. Um, we need to be sensible about how we use them. We certainly need to think about using them when we when we do our risk assessments you know when we're doing and making our agronomic decisions we need to be using them when we feel there's a need you know we don't want to be exerting selection pressure when we may be able not you know to get away with not using an sdhi application perhaps at a t1 on a more resistant variety, you know, the, these kinds of situations. And just be mindful that the more dose you put on, the higher the selection pressure. But you are clearly looking for, there's that balance to be had between effective disease control and how much selection pressure you're exerting. But going back to the question, because I'm kind of conscious I'm meandering around here a little bit. Um, Will it significantly present itself this year? Who knows? Um, I think the AHDB was saying that they've seen some net blotch issues in barley in the field last year. Um, our friends over the channel in France are struggling with, uh, with net blotch and, and also they're worried about ramillaria resistance with SDHIs. Uh, but the last part of this question asks, is it likely to drop off in a similar way to the strobes? Um, I would say no. Um, I think we have the strobes as one extreme, and then we have the azoles as the other extreme in terms of how quickly resistance happens. The strobes was a very quick single step. The azoles has been a partial um, it's a polymorphic resistance. It's an erosion over many years. Um, and if you were pushing me to say, where is the SDHI going to sit? It'll be somewhere in the middle. And I guess probably a little bit closer to the azoles than the strobes. That's the end. <laughs> Sorry, a very long answer. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, an interesting one now from David in Cambridgeshire. How active is Folpep versus chlorothalonil on Septorian odorum? And do you have any info on, resist on the resistance of Septorian odorum to triazoles or SDHIs? Yeah, this is a, this is a good question. This is, this is one that falls into the category of, um, I certainly think we need to, we need to search out. Um, we've, we focus very much, uh, on Septoria triticae, but we will look at Septoria in the Dorum, or I'll, I'll see if I can seek out some information comparing Folpet to chlorothalonil on the Dorum. Um, okay. And also, I don't really have, uh, to my knowledge, any resistance data on the Dorum, certainly, certainly not that Adama has. Um, so I think we'll have to get back to David on that one. Okay, we'll send it round when we send the, the recording round. Okay, for the third question in this section, with the declining effectiveness of triazoles and heavy reliance on the new SDHI chemistries to act as an eradicant, could we end up having to move to, the, to using regular applications of multi-site protectants such as chlorothalonil, similar to how blight programs in potatoes work? And that's from Oliver in Cambridgeshire. Um, I think this very much this very much depends on on how we go with SDHI chemistry um, and and again looking into the future. I think I think there's certainly 
there's certainly a case to be had um, for considering coating some of the leaf layers that we don't coat, um, uh, which which would represent more frequent applications. Um, you know, routinely we do not uh, coat leaf two um, as a t the T one and a half uh, is you know is not is not a is not a hugely widely um, used spray timing. Um, simply because I think it's a challenge to to get in there and get it on in uh, you know from an operational sense. But um, if we believe that 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 we're moving forward. Um, in a situation where we need to be more and more about protection, um, then maybe we should be asking ourselves that, uh, the question of should we be coating every leaf layer, um, certainly with a multi-site, um, then, then perhaps if you look in a crystal ball a little bit way out in the future, Who's to say what's going to happen from a resistance point of view and also the impact of um, legislation, um, you know, as, uh, as, as some of the things such as um, endocrine criteria take hold in the coming years. What's that going to do to triazyl chemistries, for example? How many of those are we going to have uh, in the coming years? And what's going to happen to SDHI in terms of resistance? I think these are all... Um, the, the, these are all factors which 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 could mean that we really need to think about um, a much more a full um, preventative role uh, in wheat. Obviously, it's an integrated um, system. So, you know, we're now seeing more and more um, host resistance from wheat varieties on the recommended list, and so we should be we should be embracing those in an integrated approach. Um, so, so, you know, host resistance using multi-sites where you've got a, a, a much lower penalty in terms of risk for resistance, uh, maybe coating more leaves um, and protecting existing chemistries. Yeah, perhaps in the future, but, but who can say? Excellent. Um, I think here, this, this slide was in here just to, uh, I've, I've probably talked about a lot of this now, but um, obviously in the, in the kind of the toolbox, these are, these are obviously the three main uh, groups of chemistries for septoria control. Um, you know, they, particularly azoles, but also multi-sites of threats of regulatory restrictions. Um, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of you will be aware that that chlorothalonil, the cornerstone multi-site for septoria control for many years, um, is going through its re-registration process, um, and there is a the EFSA document is out in the public domain, um, and I think I think there's a lot of speculation. Uh, people will always speculate as to what will happen. Um, when when the products are re-registered, um, firstly at an EU level as the AI, and then what happens to the product registrations at national level. But I think one thing's for sure, we won't be able to do what we have been doing with chlorothalonil in that we we were taking advantage of the kind of loophole of, of using different product labels to make sure that we could apply lots and lots of timings. Um, it's probably going to be limited or restricted in some way. Um, so, you know, there are changes there. There will be changes with azoles because, because um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a fact that epoxyconazole, you know, will no longer be available um, after, after 19 and, and, and other azoles will also um, uh, will be either restricted or not make it through the registration uh, re-reg processes. So, so we it is challenging. We do have a new mode of action coming, um, and we have new um, new generation SDHIs coming and mixtures of SDHIs, etc. So there are tools there. We just need to make sure that we protect them and that we 
use them in the correct ways. Um, and one of the keys to that is actually spraying them at the right time. Um, not getting into a curative situation. We can't do that anymore. Um, if we apply them at the right time, we probably still have the tools to keep on top of the disease. Um, although if you get years like 2012 and 2014, it does get harder. And when, when intervals get stretched, that's when uh, we, we have a problem because the solutions to get us out of uh, some of those difficult situations um, aren't as good as they used to be, particularly with the azole uh, curative activity now being eroded. Okay. Okay, on to the next section. Sticking with resistance management, but moving more on to triazoles. I'm going to take two questions at the same time because they're, they're quite similar. So the first is from Ray in Down and Market, and he asks, how best should triazoles be used on wheat during the season using different AIs? And the second one is from Sarah in Cambridgeshire, um, which asks, there is much debate around the use of epoxy at T0. Key players in the industry suggest that this should be saved for a later point in the program to ensure as many different trials as possible are used in the program. What are your thoughts? Um, I think I think this really um, there there are some there are some strong views on this, uh, and then there are some views which aren't as strong as as always. There's always opinions. I think. Um, I think it's, um, or it has been widely known that within the triazole group, um, then even though we have cross resistance across that mode of action, so it doesn't matter which triazole it is, then um, you will have cross resistance. Um, but it is pretty clear that because of the different strains, then different triazoles can select um, for for different mutation makeups. So I think it's easier to term it as certain triazoles grouped together have strong cross resistance between them. So so just picking some of the well known ones. Prothioconazole and epoxyconazole select for very similar strain profiles. Um, together in there as well will be ciproconazole, for example. But then if you look at metconazole and tebiconazole, then they would strongly uh, select for a certain type of cross resistance, but it's a little bit different from epoxy um, and prothio. So there's quite a quite a bit of uh, thought here from some people that that really we should be alternating azoles. Um, so you know, don't use the same azole multiple times. Um, you know, labels do allow you to use them quite a lot repeatedly, but you know, so the thinking is at T zero, perhaps if you were using say tebuconazole, then you could use epoxyconazole at T1, so, uh, and vice versa. But, but maybe don't go epoxyconazole at T0, then followed by prothioconazole at T1, because you might be selected for the same strains. You, you know, so I think it's about, I think it's about this alternation. Um, and for example, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's a different population, but, but Chuggers, for example, very much um, their messages are alternate triazoles as much as possible from these different groups because of this uh, strong uh, cross resistance between certain members of the uh, triazoles. Um, interestingly, if we call them azoles, then there is one compound. Uh, prochloras, which is actually an imidazole, so it's not a triazole. And prochloras actually selects for slightly different uh, strains than, than most of the other triazoles. So that, that, that's also something to take into account. That might be something interesting to include in programs. 
Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> Over to Richard B in Warwickshire. Please give, give us an indication of the future of triazoles in controlling septoria. Um, I think I think I probably touched on this in the previous section. I think I mean um, an indication of on the future. I think they'll continue to be eroded. Uh, if you look at the uh, at the data presented at the HDB conference that comes out every year, and you you track it, um, the sensitivity shifts are clear. They move year on year, um, and they keep moving, and the um, and 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 the actual sensitivity curves are starting to tilt over at the top, which means that we're getting more highly insensitive strains as a percentage of the population um, and so i think i think particularly poxiconazole and prothiconazole you know they're they're the two key azoles um, for septoria control um, and we use them a lot and so there's a lot of selection pressure but but mixing with multi-sites um, I mean, we've done work with Falpo, which actually shows that 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 you can that you can mitigate selection pressure uh, by actually mixing multi sites. So it's a you know it's it's sound resistance management to have multi sites in there, um, and also with 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 other modes of action such as SDHIs protecting azoles. They're all they're all kind of protecting each other in a way. So um, I think azoles will continue to be a part of. Uh, the septoria strategy they still have some curative activity left it's not all gone um, and so they still are very useful um, but it's it's like anything else you know let's let's not let's not use them in situations where um, your, your expectations are too high the protectant um, activity is still relatively good, so so we should be we should be trying to be in protectant situations. I think really uh, with septoria all the time. So uh, and I think they'll still be there in the future, probably up to the point where the regulators say we can't have them anymore. Great, thank you, Andy. Last one in this section. Um, I think that's it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. That, that was it for that one. Uh, um, last one on this section is from David in Bedfordshire. How does an efflux pump work? Does it only affect fungicides or could the performance of herbicides be reduced as well? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, an efflux pump is a, actually this is this, this is a mutation now within within the septoria uh, pathogen, which which is becoming more and more widespread. Um, Rothamsted's data shows that efflux pumps are on the increase, um, and this this mutation enables the septoria pathogen to actively pump out the fungicide that's actually coming into the cell. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a word for these uh, for these septoria uh, strains, really, but I, I won't say it over the air. Um, but but yeah, they they really they really are mutating some some really clever ways of doing things. So so they can actually pump out the uh, the fungicide um, from the substrate. So so it doesn't actually um, it doesn't actually act on them. Um, and I think um, d does it only affect fungicides? I mean I, I'm only focused on fungicides. Could could its performance of herbicides? I, I, it wouldn't surprise me. And I think I think I have seen evidence uh, in research that that these things could exist for uh, for other um, other crop protection products as well. But certainly in septoria, this is something that um, that is on the rise. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Um, just on, in this section, some, some slides here. Some of you, are, or a number of you, will be familiar with this. This is, this is some old data from 2002 to 14 about azole activity um, with prothiconazole and epoxiconazole. Protectant activity declining, but you'll see on the right-hand side the eradicant activity 
you know, declining right down to to around 20, 30 percent of, of what it was um, back in in 2002. And I mean, I mean, in the in the early 2000s, you know, we can probably remember that you could have septoria in a crop and you weren't too worried because as long as you got a spray on, um, you'd be OK. Well, those days are, are over, really. Um, so so protective programs are key um and this this is this is just something that this is the rothamsted data bart fry's data from rothamsted which was uh, published by the hdb um and this is pro thio again over the years and this is the uh this is the sensitivity in vitro of strains of septoria which are, which are sampled from the field um, and as they move towards the right, it indicates a decline in, uh, in sensitivity because you need more um, prothioconazole to, uh, to control them. And you can see where that red circle is, that at the top of the curve, the amount which are becoming more and more insensitive is increasing as that end of that curve starts to flatten out. Um, and in time, that will start to tilt right over and, and, and those strains will become a higher percentage probably each year of the population as we go forward. So it's as long as we're exerting the selection pressure, then we will select the mutations. But that's, um, that's the way it goes. You know, you, unless, unless you decrease it with something, then, um, then, then we will continue to do it and there will be erosion, but we can slow it by, as I've said, resistance management, mixing with different modes of action, well-timed, um, and with azoles, keeping rates up. With azoles, it, there's, a, there, there's a kind of um, a trade-off where, where we find that keeping rates up with azoles, because it's such a gradual resistance, um, it's the best thing to do for the balance between um, disease control and uh, selection pressure. Um, just something here on, 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 on the key points of resistance management for septoria. Um, I've been going around for, for the last couple of years talking about this, this multi-site first in the tank. It's, it, it's not the mixing order, it's more about you multi-site is the cornerstone. That should be, um, that should be the first in the selection and then build the other components around it as you need it in an integrated control once you've taken into account the varietal host resistance, um, you know, weather conditions, drilling date of the crop, all the other risk factors that you need to take into account when you design a new program. And also, of course, those other drivers which may not be septoria because you might have a variety uh, um, with, a, with, with a challenge of yellow rust and therefore T0 would become, uh, you know, critical for uh, for getting something in there to uh, to deal with yellow rust as well but but if 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 we're talking septoria you should always have the multi-site in there okay okay so this is the last section and this is all about the the crop protection element so we'll go one by one here um first question which growth stage has the best chemical results and that's ian from norfolk Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting one. Um, if I'm interpreting the correct the question correctly, I'd be I'd be inclined to say the best the best response from fungicide inputs probably comes at T two. I mean, that's where you really really need to be um, having a, a, an extremely robust um, spray program in there at t3 but of course of course if we if we're in if we're in a situation where we're protecting all the time t1 is extremely important as well because you you cannot you cannot let um septoria be infected leaf three so you need to protect it at t1 um so that you don't have that subsequent infection then going up to t up to uh, leaf two uh, and putting pressure on the uh, on the t2 timing when um when the flag leaf is uh, is fully emerged, so um, 
I think I think the answer to that is as the best result. I kind of think maybe um, or I'll wait until one of these other questions comes up before I say anything else, I think. OK, OK. And the next one is Andrew from Northamptonshire. Is timing more critical than dose rate for septoria control? <laughs> They're both critically important, but I would say timing. Timing, <laughs> yeah, timing. We really need to get the timing right. Um, dose rate is important equally because of what I've said before. We, um, we don't want to be putting too much on when we don't need to, but equally we need to get the right amount on. And the, there's a lot of, lot of different things to consider when you're choosing your rates. Um, but I would say absolutely. If we, if, if we leave, if for example, you let your T1 slip and, and, and you, you get latent infection going in, in leaf three, and the weather is is conducive, you know, you will be struggling to get that back. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, and I don't know whether Syngenta paid this person, uh, John from Kent, is chlorothalonil the answer? <laughs> um, Okay, as as an adapt look, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this this impartially. Um, Chlorothalonil uh, is 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 a fantastic um, septoria multi-site contact protectant. You know, its um, it, it, its efficacy is is excellent in terms of the expectation for, as I say, a contact protectant. Um, but I do think that 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 we you know that there, there there is room now for for other contact protectants because there are other options available um and i and i do think that the review process on chlorothalonil will probably in some way change the way we can use chlorothalonil compared to how we can use it currently so um if that's the way the question is pitched, then uh, then that would be my answer. Um, but I think multi sides are absolutely crucial, and we should you know uh, we should continue to to use multi sites, and they should be the absolute first thing in the tank for septari control. Great, thank you. So the next one from David in Perthshire: How cost effective is T naught? Yeah, this is this is one where uh, there's a number of opinions um, around for 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 this one. I think um, I I think it's difficult to actually show um, a financial return often from uh, from a T zero, um, but I think in some years it is, and I. I uh, you know, in, in, in real intense years, I mean, what says to me is if you've got an opportunity in the spring um, to do something about leaf four, um, then 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 you, sh you should do that. Um, but I think equally, we need to think about what we're using at T0, perhaps from a resistance management point of view. Um, if it's only septoria, and rust isn't in the equation. Um, do you really need to be putting an azole on? I think, I think even if rust is in the equation, some people would argue that you could look at a different mode of action together with the multi-site and um, and and maybe use a strobile urine. Um, but then again, if you have a high risk of rust, then azoles you know tebuconazole epoxyconazole cipriconazole these these things are incredibly fast acting um and and very good against yellow rust um and and it becomes difficult to uh, i i always think if you if you have a variety for example if it was me and i was growing reflection um and and of course susceptible to septoria susceptible to yellow rust um, my T zero, I think I'd be uh, I'd be struggling to look away from an Azel plus uh, a multi site really because um, because the the strobile urine just protects really and I think I think if if 
if the conditions are conducive for yellow rust, I'd be driven more down the uh, azole route. Um, but anyway, going back to Septoria and how cost effective is T0, I think you can, you can, you can show a benefit. Um, in 2012 and 2014, we probably saw trials. Um, certainly, you can, you can produce trials data that can, sometimes shows a benefit, but it, it, it's, it's sometimes rather than always. Um, I think T0 with Septoria is a little bit more about an insurance because if you've if you've applied uh, a multi-site or an azol multi-site at t0 and you're delayed on your t1 that may help you a little bit um, the impact of a delayed t1 may not quite be um, as difficult to deal with as it would have been if you hadn't have put anything on at T0. So again, depending on risk factors, you have to look at, you know, variety drilling day. You have to go through, you have to go through them all and make your decision. But I think, I think looking at the actual costs of, of making a T0, um, you know, I, 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 I would say, I would say you, you're brave not to on a, certainly on a susceptible variety. Great, thanks Andy. So the last one in this section, what's the persistence of Folpet? Does it tank mix with other rusty HIs? What's the best application? Is it air inclusion, low drift nozzles? And that's from Ian in Dorset. Okay. Um, the persistence of Folpet. We we have some work that that we actually uh, when we launched Folpet we um, we took out to the market, which which actually showed that Folpet is still working thirty five days after application, but they were controlled studies. So I think we have to think contact protectant. You know these things they uh with 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 external and environmental conditions it's not going to be uh 35 days we, we we're talking a little I, I don't absolutely have a clear definitive answer to that um but we're talking we're talking a couple of weeks or so um because because if you get a lot of rain you know they they do start to suffer from from erosion etc um so you know if you really look it'll still be giving you some some useful control um at the end of your three week interval when you're probably going on with your next application i think in terms of does it tank mix with all sdhis um i would say yes um both both on a on a, a physical level um but also we uh, we do have data that shows that um, that certainly with the with the current SDHIs um, we don't uh, we don't interfere with uh, with uptake or antagonize. Um, so I think I think that's that. And then the best application, yeah, interesting one. I think I think what we need to say is if we're talking Folpet. Again, it's a contact protectant. So what you need to do is you, you need to apply it uh, to give you good coverage. So it relies on good coverage. So it's not moving about a great deal. So it, we need good coverage. Um, so I always get a little bit um, a little bit uncomfortable when water volumes are cut too much. I know I know people like to reduce water volumes down. But I would, I, I think I would answer this question by saying, um, aim for good coverage of the leaf because it's it's a contact protectant product. Um, air inclusion, low drift nozzles, um, yeah, I think I think anything that can, uh, in terms of air inclusion, I think anything that's small, actually, probably smaller droplets would get better coverage but equally we have to use low drift nozzles in a lot of situations so um but i think um i think air inclusion nozzles would probably be fine okay great thanks 
Is that the last slide, Andy? Yeah, this was now this was this what I was talking about here, but but this is this is in controlled conditions. So 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 this is this is in a situation where you're not getting lots of erosion of the product. I think what he's saying is just by light degradation, etc., Folpet's still acting after 35 days. But of course, if you get a lot of rainfall, etc., um, the Folpet formulation is pretty good, pretty rain fast, but um, contact protectants only uh, only have a certain uh, certain period of uh, lifetime on the leaf, and then they will start to erode a little bit in activity. Uh, yeah, just a little bit on the back of that, uh, water volumes, etc. We do have a qualified recommendation on the label, so you can use 100 litres per hectare, but it's not spot by effectiveness. And uh, I wouldn't go below that from my point of view. I think uh, I think 100 litres is, uh, is low enough, really. Okay, so... Many thanks to Andy. Uh, his job's not done just yet. Um, now's the opportunity. If you've got any burning questions still in your mind, please um, go down to the Q&A box right at the bottom of the screen. We've got one question in already. Um, so while I'm asking this one to you, Andy, anybody else, if you've got any further questions, please do feel free to jot them down. So the question from um, David, Considering the high selection pressure of applying straight SDHIs on trial sites, will the use of straight SDHIs in trials be severely limited in the future to reduce the risk of very resistant strains entering the general population from trials? Mm, that's a good question. That is a good question. Um, I think I think we need to yeah, we need we need we need to think about um, how much what what impact this is having. I guess I guess because we've seen we've seen uh, as you rightly say, David, we've seen we've seen more selection pressure exerted, and it's probably exacerbated by the fact that perhaps we're we're trying to we're trying to produce full selection pressure. So we're probably we're probably as you say spraying. SDHIs without other modes of action um, because they're they're in trials. So that that could actually be um, really shifting those populations in terms of even in one season. I mean, we know from our work um, that where we've looked at Falpet and how it can mitigate this selection pressure um, in season. We know from say two sprays of either an azole or of an SDHI that you can actually shift this, um, the population, not, not by huge amounts, but significant shift just in one season. So from two applications, say at, uh, at growth stage 32 and then at growth stage 39, you can shift it. So if you're doing that on trial sites and you're selecting out, say the, these 152 highly uh, insensitive um, strains to SDHIs, then at the end of at the end of that um there's potential there for for an ascospore loading coming out of those trial sites which has some pretty uh pretty high percentages of those high resist uh, resistant strains in there so it it could be a concern um and it, it's 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 a fair point um you, I suppose from a scientific point of view, you'd like to say, well, that's a real shame. Nobody, nobody stops us um, doing work with the um, uh, kind of uh, selecting things like phytophthora and things like that, you know, and infecting, um, infecting the local sort of uh, potato crops, et cetera. So I, I think, I think it'd be quite contentious. I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering as to what scale um it could actually affect the natural population because i think it i think it's all key to the fitness of these strains which are which have been which have been selected for if they prove to be fit and surviving 
and actually competing within natural populations, then that is a big time for us to gulp, <laughs> sharp intake of breath and think, oh dear. Um, and it's a good point, actually. It's a good point. I think it probably needs much further discussion as to what sort of a, of an impact it's having. Because I think, I think we have seen quite a difference um, from trial sites compared to uh, monitoring commercial crops. And it's quite a significant difference in the strains on trial sites. So, yeah, it's a valid point. It's a good question. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions in for Andy? Sorry? I was just saying, any more questions in for you? Uh, it doesn't look like anything else is on the table right now. Nope. Okay, so um, it just comes to me then to um, thank Andy for his time. Um, really useful questions coming in from the floor. Many thanks for the guys that have put those questions in and to you all for getting involved uh, this evening. Um, I'll just remind you, Abby is recording this and we will email it round um, so that you can share it with other people that weren't able to join us today. And that will hopefully be done on Wednesday. And we will also come back on any answers um, that we need to research a little further. Just for your information, um, we are currently running a Septoria hub on the website, which is a um, an inf Septoria information um, area where we will be posting weekly. And in addition to that, um, later on in this week, um, we will just send you an email around. This is the first um, clinic that we've run. We'd be really interested in your feedback on whether you think it's worthwhile and what you've got out of it. So. If you have enjoyed it, please uh, give us your feedback. If you've got any builds on how we can make it better, please uh, please have your say. There is one basis point for this session today and Abby will be um, sending that off to basis at the end of this session. So many thanks for your attendance. I do hope it has been useful. Um, and if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us, whether it's myself, Ali Bosha, or Andy, Bailey, or any of your other Adama representatives, please do get in touch and uh, wish you all a good night. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.